uh, we're very grateful that uh, Phil Bourne has accepted to be our uh, keynote speaker uh, this year. Uh, I'm going to say a little bit about, uh, about Phil. So uh, Phil um, is a Stevenson Chair of Data Science and the Director of Data Science at the University of Virginia. Um, he's a professor in the, in the Department of Biomedical Engineering. Uh, but we, we all know Phil uh, as uh, essentially the Chief Data Scientist of the National Institute of Health um, and a Senior Investigator at the NCBI. Um, now his accolades right, uh, include uh, leading the Big Data to Knowledge Research Initiative, uh, really which had a, can you, can you imagine, a budget of $110 million per year. That's really formidable. Um, and uh, in addition to this, um, well, every researcher is always really proud of the uh, number of publications they, they have. Now, I, I don't think anybody in this room, other than Phil, maybe Dean, uh, but has, has reached 350 publications. Right, that is really, truly impressive. Right, five books and f co-founded four companies. Right, so this, this, we are really, really honored to be able to have Phil uh, to come along and, and present his keynote to us. So, Phil, thank you so much. So I, I've kind of said a bit about this already. Um, I think you're going to get a, a pretty biased opinion from me, and you have to take that with a grain of salt. Uh, but I think we're, we're heading towards a very different future than the one we have now in many ways. I'm going to try and illustrate that to you uh, in a couple of different ways. Uh, but as I said, I can't really give you a technical perspective at this point because I've essentially become a bureaucrat. But let me sort of... And I also want to, before I tell you, um, give you some opinions, I want to let you know what biases I bring to those opinions. So, and some of those are based on lessons I learned a long time ago. How many of you have actually ever touched or done anything with MMSIF? Uh, a few people are owning up to the fact. Okay, so essentially uh, MMSIF was something that uh, was developed by, actually it's really the brainchild of uh, John Westbrook, uh, at Rutgers University in the US, but a number of us were part of it a, a number of years ago. And if you look on the right-hand side, uh, it's based on a thing called STAR, which is Self-Defining uh, self Text Archive and Retrieval uh, for, format, actually. And essentially what it is is a series of encoding rules, which are then used to create a dictionary definition language, which in turn is used to create dictionaries, which in turn uh, data files conform to those dictionaries. So this predates anything to, no, this, this predates XML. So we worked, and so there were some lessons worked on this. So on the, on the, on the uh, left-hand side, there's actually, uh, this is taken, this is what the Protein Data Bank, which I worked on for many years, uses. And effectively on the left-hand side is the, the complete description of an X Cartesian coordinate for an atom. And it's quite rigorous in terms of, uh, you know, it's, it's a, a set of name-value pairs. Uh, it's, it's got looping. Uh, it's got certain characteristics that essentially say it's not a mandatory data item. I mean, in a, in a, a molecule, an atom can be missing, or you can't actually see an atom uh, for whatever reasons, experimentally. Uh, but the x-coordinate doesn't have any meaning unless the y and z-coordinates are there as well. All of that is encoded into this representation. So it became a very rigorous way of validating uh, data, and it's, it, it came about because the original PDB format could no longer handle the complexity and type of structures that we were getting. So this arose, uh, it was one of those things we all got together, and it drove my wife crazy, because we tend to get together on a Sunday afternoon, and a group of us would sit down and start making these definitions. We allowed ourselves seven weeks to do this. Uh, it took seven years. Um, and so what I learned in this process, and perhaps some of you have also had uh, not dissimilar experiences, is science essentially is what happened while you're sitting there writing formal definitions. Uh, it's, uh, I think if you, uh, you, you really need to define the audience. I think we defined it 3,000 different uh, entities within this space. Only about three or 400 of those are ever used. 
So we, we actually spent a lot of time and effort uh, for things that uh, were not used. Increasingly more and more used, but still nowhere near what we did. It was way too complex for most people. Most people would not engage with it uh, because of the complexity. And you know, we didn't develop enough software to support it uh, in the early stages. And it, wasn't, uh, it just didn't get the kind of adoption. Uh, and so it took many years for that eff initial effort to take off. And today it has taken off. If you do any kind of structural bioinformatics work, you'll more than likely encounter this kind of representation. But in all of that, it was extremely important because it, it formed the underpinnings, the foundation, if you like, for the protein data bank, uh, at least in the time, still in fact, but uh, these are the years that I was in, involved with it. And just, you can just see that, that this is the growth and the use of RESTful services that pulled, that pulled on this uh, representation uh, in the bottom right hand uh, side. And so it was, it was regarded in many ways as a very successful uh, data resource and still is. Uh, it also, of course, spawned a lot of uh, activity around the field of uh, structural bioinformatics, for which uh, I'm still working in. And I'm going to give you a couple of examples to illustrate points from data science in a minute. But you know that, that's sort of the backdrop here for what I really want to tell you. So let's return to our original question, given that these are the sort of biases I'm bringing to it based on long years of experience with some of these things. How does data science uh, impact the semantic web and, and web and indeed the other way around? In my mind, uh, the short answer is profoundly. Uh, by virtue of the fact, of course, that data science is everywhere and data is everywhere. And, and it's not just in biomedicine, as I mentioned at the beginning. So how many of you are familiar with the fourth paradigm? A few. Okay, so let me just give you a sense of uh, why I'm saying what I'm saying with respect to data. So we're kind of in this situation right now where um, the, we're the fourth paradigm. So I have to put my glasses on. So I suppose I could go over here. So uh, where we have the first paradigm was essentially observational, where we actually conducted, we observed things, uh, and uh, we did experiments associated with that. The second phase was really uh, model-based theoretical study, theory of relativity, thermodynamics, and so on. And these things, you know, the, the, short, the length of which these different paradigms uh, were sort of came into play uh, actually is shortened dramatically. Uh, the third paradigm was really uh, computational science, when computing really became an integral part of the scientific enterprise. Uh, that was the third paradigm which started in the 1950s and, of course, is still going on to some extent. And the fourth paradigm, and I encourage you to look at this book, it's actually uh, put out by Microsoft, but let's not hold that against them. It's actually free and downloadable as a PDF. And um, the reason it's Microsoft's involved is because the fourth paradigm was coined by Jim Gray. Uh, Jim Gray was a Turing Prize winner, uh, did a lot of work in data science. He actually disappeared at sea. It was a very interesting data science story. Uh, surrounding Jim Gray, which I won't get into. But he coined this notion of the fourth paradigm, which is really the notion of data, complete data-driven science. And I think the point, as far as I'm concerned, as I sit in an institution uh, developing a large institute, which is going to actually become even larger very soon, uh, where I sit at the center of the campus, not affiliated with computer science, information science, statistics, applied mathematics, or anyone else, but work across all domains, whether it be anything from biomedicine to politics to history to life science uh, to uh, English literature, that analytics, and I'm going to give you an illustration of what's happening, uh, is absolutely profoundly impacting everything. And uh, I think that's only going to continue. And I think this is an enormous opportunity for what you do uh, with respect to the semantic web. So how will science change as a result of this? Um, I could give you my own definition. I should say, by the way, I've spent a fair bit of time thinking about what the fifth paradigm is. Uh, we could talk about that later. I'd be interested to hear what you, you have to say. And I should also say at this point, not that anyone ever really responds, is I actually hate giving lectures now. Uh, I much prefer having dialogues with the audience. So at any moment you, know, you feel inspired to disagree or yell out something, I encourage you uh, to do so. Um, 
Uh, you, uh, another thing, a good thing about being old is you, you can no longer offend me. Uh, that's all happened many years ago. Um, okay, so how will science change? And I, rather than giving my own thoughts about it, let me quote someone who's uh, a Peter Diamantis who's thought a lot about this. And he speaks about the six Ds. And you can see these six Ds here. And it begins with digitization. So I'm going to illustrate this, uh, this kind of change that's, that's happening to us with a particular example. This is an example, as was mentioned, I was the chief data officer of the National Institutes of Health in the US for a while. Uh, I reported to Francis Collins, who's the director of NIH, who reports to the Secretary of Health and Human Services, who reports to the president. Uh, you can beginning to see why I left. Uh, um, but let's not go there. Um, but anyway, at some point, I presented this to uh, the advisory board of the director of NIH, which is the, the board that essentially makes all the decisions for how NIH spends $36 billion a year currently. And uh, I, I, I was really trying to emphasize this kind of change. So the issue is that when you have these six Ds, you begin with digitization. And of course, that has begun in life sciences, and it's been going on for some while. The question is, is the degree of acceleration and where we are on this curve. And I'm going to illustrate what happens on this curve with respect to just using a, an example that has nothing to do with life sciences. It has to do with photography. And so what happens as you go, th think about what happened in photography. So uh, Kodak invented the digital camera, and then they decided to shelve it. They shelved it because they felt it was interfering with their chemical business, which is where they were making all their money. And then, of course, others started to get into the business. And the number of uh, uh, pixels in a, in a photograph, the, number, or the, uh, the resolution of photographs, the number of pixels in a camera increased. And, but it was at a dis and, and so things, the number of digital photographs was growing. It was growing exponentially, but it was growing in accordance with this exponential curve where, in fact, we had this deceptive phase when you're low down on the curve. Then what happens, of course, is you get to a disruptive phase where you, it's the inflection point when it was basically too late. It was too late for Kodak. They essentially went uh, bankrupt because they hadn't realized what was going on early enough. And so then what happened is, which I think is equally intriguing, we went through this period of demonetization. A photograph actually wasn't really worth anything anymore per se. There wasn't a cost really in producing it. So that led to demonetization. It also led to dematerialization. But interestingly, it also led to democratization because what it did was to create a whole set of businesses that in fact were more valuable Instagram and so on uh, are more valuable than uh, Kodak ever was, and yet their business model is completely different. I mean, it's about communicating using images. It's not about photographs per se. So what I would say in the, in the world of biomedicine is, in fact, where are we now on that curve? Are we already beyond this uh, you know, inflection point? And so you know, we're well aware of what's going on. Or indeed, are we still low down and we're going to see some level of perturbation in the future that we have yet to see? I don't really know the answer to that. My gut tells me uh, that it's uh, actually we're still pretty low down on that curve. And when you work, oh good, a question. When we just say this one point, when, you, when, you, when you're immersed in a field, it's easy to think that all the a lot of the data that either you have or you're generating defines that field. And I would say we're nowhere near that point, and there's lots of different data types that virtually none of us have touched, which soon, or maybe already, are beginning to influence the type of research you do. Yeah? Um, I hope you have seen the work of the Wikidata community. I have. I'm coming to that. As many of you know Daniel Meachin, you'll know he actually works with me. He actually lives in Germany, well, he lives all over the world, but he works with me. I, I, we also, I'll come to this, but we also, I also hired a Wikimedia in residence. I, I'm totally sold on, what, on Wikidata and what you're doing, okay? And, and I, I'm just pleased that, and, and there are people here who can dress it much better than me. 
Remember, I'm a bureaucrat, but I'm behind it, so that's important. Okay, so let's. So if we're going to build on this notion and have, and as I try and get you to believe that data science is, uh, you know, something that's is, is going to have profound impact, uh, I just I would quote this. This is from Tim Berners Lee. Uh, it is the unexpected reuse of information, which is the value added by the web. I would say, and going forward, uh, it's that and subsequent analysis of that information for societal benefit. And you know, maybe that's inherent in what he said already, but it wasn't really explicitly laid out. And I think that's where uh, the change comes about. So I think uh, to date, I think data science is too frequently the unexpected reuse of information without the semantic web. And I think I'll give you an example to illustrate that. Um, but I, I would argue how much more powerful it will be or is starting to be with the semantic web. So to illustrate how things work without the semantic web and the kind of things that excite the heck out of me, I'm going to give you an example. So I was sitting in my office one day and a fellow knocks on the door and says, uh, I'm a, a trauma surgeon here in our hospital. I work in the emergency room. And I said, well, you know, I had the data science thing. What, what, what possible thing could we talk to each other about? He said, well, I want to tell you some things I've been doing. So he said, I noticed I've been doing this for 20 years. And a lot of the patients that come in into, with trauma are the result of car accidents. And I've noticed over the years that there is a correspondence between, ultimately I discover, the type of injuries they have, which are very often internal and are not immediately obvious, and the type of accident they had. I got so intrigued in this, I started looking at it antidotally, and then a little more. So he went to, uh, he, he's in the hospital, so he has elect access to the electronic health record. Then he went to the Department of Motor Vehicles, which in the US is a place you never want to visit unless you have to. It's, ho it's horrible. Um, but it's where you, they actually have public data you can request and get hold of with respect to uh, the types of car accidents that occur in different areas. So he took all the data from the counties surrounding uh, where the hospital is. He then looked toward himself a little Python, a little R, and he actually started looking for correlations between the kind of accident that happened and the injuries that were ultimately diagnosed. And the reason he did this is because quite often uh, patients die in the scanner. Because they come in, they don't know what's wrong with them, they do full body scans. By the time they figure that out, they've died. If you already, when the person arrived at the emergency room, you already knew the kind of accident they had. You all know, already knew, based on these correlations, the kind of internal injuries they probably had. You could address that further first and perhaps save lives. So that was the motivation uh, for this. And why, why did this excite me so much? Uh, first of all, there's no question it has potentially societal benefit. Second, it's kind of someone out of left field who's, I wouldn't say it's crowdsourced, but it's just someone that came at this completely independently. It's self-taught, and yet, and most importantly, which I think is the essence of the future, it brought together data sets that we would never have otherwise thought about. And this is happening over and over again. I just see it every day in lots of very exciting ways. In this case, it was accident data that came from the Department of Motor Vehicles, which is a you know, government agency, and you know, the electronic health record. So I think that's, to me, uh, you know, really a telling kind of example for what, what the future holds. And what it holds for you is when you try and do that, and when you try and munge that data, as you well, m most of you know better than I do at this point, uh, enormous amounts of time go into interpreting data where indeed things related to the semantic web can really help. So to, give, to put some more context on this, I think you know, we debate, OK, if data science is this emerging thing, well, what is it exactly? And you asked, if I asked you all in this room, you'd all say something different. On the other hand, if I asked you what the internet is, you'd probably, well, if you're a cohesive group, maybe you'd say something similar. But my bet would be you'd say something significantly different, each of you. And what does it matter? You all use it every day. You're all using data science every day. So I don't get locked up in these definitions. It's really what you do with what you believe. 
But just to put some context on it, uh, what we're talking about from my perspective is essentially trying to use open, complex, diverse digital data for many different disciplines. Uh, and then really finding ways of, uh, of answering uh, relevant and unthought of questions, at least prior to, by combining these diverse data sets, getting statistically significant findings, that's a whole issue of course, and then sharing those in a useful way, which is something this community is very good at, and I applaud you for that. It's not true in many of the communities I'm now dealing with. And then translating this into some action that in, improves the human condition. And it's easy for my, me to say, because I, I was told, published a lot of papers, I don't actually care if I don't publish another paper my whole life. What's really important to me is actually translating in some way what we're doing into something that has some uh, actual actionable use. So just to sort of give you an example of open, complex, diverse data, this is actually taken from a recent review. I work in the area of systems pharmacology a fair bit. Uh, my colleague, Lei Ji, uh, drew this picture. And it really just you know, gives you one sense in your own domain uh, of complex data. We're talking about data that transcends across um, many different scales. So it's multi-scale integration. There are a series of different tools that are used uh, as in, the, in, the, in the horizontal integration of that data. And then, of course, there's data on different organisms. Um, so this, this is clearly examples you're familiar with. And we're already doing some high degrees of aggregation across that, that kind of data set. But what happens when you, know, you bring in other kinds of things? Just to give you, I don't want to sidetrack here, but just one example. Uh, you know, this, in some level, embodies what might be happening in autism. What it doesn't embody in any way is what might be some of the ex extraneous causes that relate to the environment. How do you pull in environmental data? Data science is doing that now. It walks over to the environmental sciences department, or whatever it might be, and starts really integrating and aggregating with those people to try and use it, findings that they have, which are probably geospatial, with findings on patients you might have uh, that, to actually start looking for correlations and this kind of thing. So it's just really broadening the spectrum of data types. So why is all this happening now? Uh, I think it's the amount of data, when you look at it from a, a machine learning and AI perspective, which I'm not going to go into any details, I'll give you an example in a second. But obviously, the amount of data that's available for training that's usable uh, really is uh, en enabling these techniques to get much better. Uh, the fact that there's a lot of open source code out there, particularly in R and Python, which facilitates uh, the, the use um, and, and, and operation in this space. And then really the GPUs themselves uh, that have come along that came out of companies like NVIDIA and out of the gaming industry, they've had a profound effect uh, on what we can do um, in terms of deep learning and so forth. There's been some improvements in algorithmic efficiency, but that's relatively small compared to these other points. Um, and then I think success promotes research, further research. I'll show you a graph in a minute uh, of, uh, of, what's, of, of, of why I say that. And then commercialization. Uh, I think what's interesting is the private sector has actually done much more in the use of machine learning, in my opinion, than has been going on in academia. And a lot of that's now being given back to academia, and it becomes a bit of a leapfrogging process. But I have to say, I'll just give you an example, and it's not strictly to do with machine learning, but it sort of illustrates the point. I spent, how many of you here have, you, have used dbGaP? One or two. Okay, so dbGaP is a database of genotype to phenotype information that's maintained by National Library of Medicine in the US. Uh, I spent a year when I was at NIH convincing the powers that be that this should go into the cloud and be operable in the cloud uh, with these kinds of tools. Uh, that was a very hard sell. Then I, immediately I left, I went and I started working with a company called Capital One, which is a big financial company. They put everything in, their, their whole business, their Fortune 500 company, their whole business is cloud-based. So, you know, the, the idea that the, the, the government wouldn't work this way was just craziness when companies are working very successfully in these environments and using these tools. So I think that feedback loop is now coming from the commercial sector back into academia. 
So why now? I think another uh, aspect, and I'm sorry, this is rather a US-centric view, and I apologize for that, but uh, when I was at the NIH, uh, Francis Collins, the director, said to me, well, how much data do we actually have here? And I said, I haven't the faintest idea. So I tried to project. Uh, so about 20% of that budget, that $36 billion, is spent uh, in internal to NIH, and 80% goes to external research grants. So I could actually measure how much data we had internally, and I just extrapolated and come up, came up to the, with the notion that we had about, at the time, this is two years ago now, we had 650 petabytes. Uh, only about 3% of that was actually in the resources that many of you use all the time, that uh, GenBank and, and, and dbGaP and these other things we talked about. Uh, but what was really scary is that a lot of that data uh, is just dark data. So uh, folks at NLM did a study where they took a year of PubMed Central, they looked for all of the data sets that were referenced in those papers, the full text of those papers in PubMed Central, then they looked to resolve those data sets. Where were they, whether they were in public archives or they were available from the author's website, wherever it was. Only 12% of that data uh, was actually available. 88% of it had gone already. And the chances of getting it, uh, you may have all had this experience at some time. You write to the, or I've actually published an editorial about this a few years ago by asking authors uh, f for data from their papers. <laughs> it's, uh, it's, a, it's uh, you can guess. Um, it, it goes from anything from a wonderfully annotated tarball or whatever uh, that comes the next day to promises three years later that I'm still working on it, but it's coming soon. Um, and then they stop, they don't write to you anymore after that. So I think, so there's a lot of, uh, you know, I think there's issues of cost and use, and, and I think there's a realization that we make, need to make better use uh, for the data that's costing us significant amounts of money. So this is a driver. Another driver, and I apologize for this again, it doesn't matter that you, you don't necessarily have to read this, I'll explain enough. It's about training and what's going on. Uh, each of those balls on the right-hand side, uh, this is taken, this, these are different fields of, of, inquire, of, of job postings. So it's finance and insurance, health and social assistance, I'm going, I'm going down, those, down that uh, y-axis there on the right-hand side, information manufacturing and so on. And the size of the ball is the percentage of the number of jobs available as was determined by text mining all of the job, uh, job postings uh, that require analytics-enabled skills or actual data science skills directly. Bottom line is it's huge. And on the right-hand side uh, is what uh, essentially growth rate, average dollars per hour of employees in the US, again, apologize for the uh, US centricity of this, uh, but that's where I work, so that's how it happens. Um, but you can see that those with higher analytical skills make more, even though that's, that's flat, that's a function of the economies worldwide, but uh, clearly a lot more than in uh, higher physical types of environments. So we have students that we graduate in our data science program after an 11-month master's program that are making over 200, this is, we're in our fifth year. The first year, students, some of them are making over $250,000 a year. Uh, so, you know, the idea, so what does all that tell you? It tells you this field is as hot as can be. There's huge demand for these people. There's a huge set of opportunities to work and get these sort of people. On the other hand, it's pretty hard, you know. Just think about it, someone's scratching their head, well, should I do, let's see, four or five years PhD at $40,000 a year, and then a three-year postdoc, and then find I can't get any grants anyway, when I could be making 250000 you know, you, you get the picture. So, but I, you know, I think uh, we need to be training more and more data science kind of folks, and programs are cropping up, I'm sure they are here in Europe as well, uh, really biomedical data science now. I was at a, recently at a meeting in Denmark, uh, with uh, Novo Novortis, where they were trying to de no determine uh, what they should do next in bioinformatics. And people actually started calling it biomedical data science, not bioinformatics. So watch out, <laughs> it's coming. Uh, but here's the thing. <laughs> none of our current, and I sort of said this already, but none of our current training programs, uh, certainly in what we're doing within this data science initiative that I have, I'm, I'm running right now, really cover the, this is mainly in the master's level, cover the semantic web in any kind of detail. 
this is, it's kind of something that's been bypassed. And, you know, I think that's partly a function of who set up the program versus what we're trying to do now. But I think there's a need to interject more of what the semantic web represents into what data scientists are currently doing. That's my point. So to illustrate that, I'm going to sort of give you uh, uh, some examples. Um, so, but let me just say, how do we break down what data science is? And the way we think about it, uh, the institution that I'm running, is that you have a set of verticals, these pillars, right? So there's five pillars of data science that essentially follow the, the data flow. So this data acquisition, increasingly from things like, obviously, high throughput sequencing has been there for a long time, but now we're talking about biosensors, environmental sensors, and so on. That data's coming at enormous rates. So that's data acquisition. And then, of course, integration and engineering is where I think a lot of the semantic uh, web technologies can really be brought to bear, uh, having, of course, collected the data in the right way in the first place. Then there's the piece that everybody talks about, but it's actually only really a fifth of what goes on, which is the data analytics, which is tied up very much in machine learning. And then there's the visualization, provenance and dissemination uh, of that, uh, those outcomes. And then uh, something that we spend an enormous amount of time on, which is equally important in my opinion, which is the ethical, social and legal ramifications of what it is that we're doing, which are actually huge in this space. Um, and I'm, I'm constantly, I don't want to go into it now because I don't have time, but constantly uh, bombarded and, and surprised by findings that have ethical consequences that I would not have actually thought about. So let's just focus on those five pillars for a, a minute or two. Uh, in the context of one area of biomedical informatics, you, you, just, you can translate this into your own field and your own interests. And I'm going to do it in the context of structural bioinformatics, which is an area I work in. Uh, so what kind of interchange in that field should be taking place uh, in data, you know, between those working in the semantic web and those doing data science? I mean, you, you may actually think, well, there's no distinction. We're, we're actually doing both. Well, that's fine. If that's true, good. I, I have my doubts, and you convince me later. Uh, let's go to the first pillar. So uh, I'm, I'm actually choosing this uh, particular uh, structural bioinformatics to illustrate these points, in part because we just wrote a review about, uh, about where uh, structural biology meets data science and what's missing and what, what, what can the two areas learn from each other. Um, clearly, with respect to data acquisition, um, we, we still have not worked out in structural biology, which has been around forever, is what to do with the raw data. What should be the persistence, if at all, of the raw data? This is the raw, depends on the, the experimental type, but say, for example, uh, diffraction images. Uh, there is some level of consistency in how data is represented uh, across instrument manufacturers. And that's, that's a good thing. And so there is the, some of the da raw data is pretty well described. Uh, and there's, that's in part because there's been societal, I mean scientific societal, and community pressure to make those sorts of things happen. But at the same time, the data, even in a well-described and well-understood and long-standing field, you know, just the, 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 the resolution of detectors, the, uh, the further enhancements in things like molecular dynamic simulation is just generating data like we've never seen before. So even in a, this well-described field, uh, there are certainly aspects of data acquisition uh, and things that are going on in sensor collections and so on that can be, that can be of value to structural bioinformatics and, and the other way around. So that's just an example from there. Uh, Data integration and engineering, um, most of you know a lot about, um, and more than I do at this point, probably about the FAIR principles and, and, and the implications of that. I would say that if you look at these fields, again, you've, you've got, in this case, it's a little biased because you're kind of a bit stooped in tradition. There's a, a lovely story, which probably, I, I think I'm probably over time already, so I won't go into telling you. So URIs are still, even though, as far as I'm aware, the Protein Data Bank, which I was involved with, because I was on the advisory board of Crossref at the time, was the first data set to use DOIs. Except we assigned DOIs, but they're not used. 
the community has fall, still falls back onto the PDB identifiers, which are not particularly well resolvable and not unique. Well, so they are unique, but they're, they're not part of a, a, a larger ecosystem. So, you know, this stoop, being stooped in, uh, in, in uh, tradition can be a problem. I described to you the MMCF, which is sort of an ontology, uh, and then there's, there's some notion of linked data, but not necessarily in the way that you would, you would expect. It's, it's through uh, these, not, in some ways, non-persistent identifiers. And so I would say that there's a lot that could come from uh, what's going on in some in data science, and certainly what you do, that could feed into data science as it relates to engineering. Uh, which is where, when, you, when we assign students projects that pull data from these kinds of places I was talking about, literally 90% of the time that they spend, as you know, is, is spent in, in, in the data engineering step. Uh, the so-called wrangling of the data. In terms of data analytics, uh, this is the graph in the center here. It just shows uh, the number of references to uh, deep learning, uh, well, actually machine learning and deep, and deep learning in the literature, in the biomedical literature, um, just in the last few years. You can see that it's just, uh, it's growing uh, very fast. So while some of us have been using SVMs and random forests and things for a long time, now we're applying, uh, you know, even, uh, more com you know, convolutional neural nets that Eli Drazen, shown there on the bottom right, is working in my lab right now. We're actually doing uh, predicting protein-protein interactions from a single interaction partner using deep convolutional neural nets with, I would say, some degree of early success. Uh, of course, my, my bias. Um, so I think those are techniques, frankly, that I would have not come across quite in the same way if I hadn't been working with people from a whole series of different fields uh, who are applying these techniques. Then there's, uh, whoops, I missed one and I don't know how to go back. And I shouldn't have done that either. All right. Um, all right, I won't, I won't go back, but I, there, was a, there was a slide there on visualization. Uh, I think that there are visualization techniques that are coming out of data science that uh, one should really look at. I think there's a lot of interesting software particularly that's coming. So I think that's uh, something to look at. I also say that you know, when you're in a field that's been around, I used to tell students this all the time, it's the notion of what I call the curse of the ribbon. All right? Everybody, I actually said to, this to Jane Richardson who invented the ribbon diagrams for showing proteins. And you've all seen them. Um, and uh, she actually, the first ones were actually driven by hand, uh, sorry, driven, written, uh, drawn by hand. And I said, to, uh, you know, this is actually a curse because it's actually locked people's minds into thinking that that's really what a protein looks like. And it's not at all. And she says, I, I get it, Phil, but how should she put it politely? Piss off. <laughs> uh, something like that. Um, so, you know, I mean, I think the point is that it, there are new ways of, you know, one needs to embrace new ways of visualization whenever you can. And then uh, there's lots that could be said of how these two communities interchange when it comes to ethics, uh, law and policy. Uh, one of the things that uh, I think is an absolute hallmark of structural biology, which was actually done many years ago, and this slide sort of just illustrates that, uh, but it was really a society and community effort that basically said, and this is still relatively rare, although in some areas it's happened, we, this community said, we are not, they went to all of the journals and said, we, or to publish of your journals, and said, we are not going to ex, uh, have our community publish in your journals if you don't uh, abide by the fact that the data must be deposited in the protein data bank before you accept that paper for publication. That had a huge impact on the field. In fact, you can see how the deposition rates changed when that came into effect. But the point is it created uh, a strong relationship between the data and the knowledge associated with that data, which for the time being is still mainly in papers, unfortunately, in my opinion, but there you go. Um, but it was actually a community society driven effort that uh, created that policy, which had a huge implication on the field. And there are, there are policies and implications and, uh, and ethical considerations that are happening in different areas that data science is pulling in from. I mean, I'm learning a lot about various areas. 
I'll just give you, I'll bore you, I don't know how my time is. Am I doing five minutes or so? Are you, are you just waving? That's oh, fine. All right, I'm almost done. Um, so I'll just give you an example because uh, I just like ranting and raving. But so I was, I, in part of what I do now, I go all over the place. I was in the law school and I was talking to people about normativity. Does anybody want know, know what normativity is? No, I didn't know either. Wikip go, go to Wikipedia. Um, normativity is the evolution of rulemaking. And so how societies, uh, as they evolve, they have loose principles that they abide by as part of the natural order of things. And those gradually get in hardened and they become policies and laws and so on. So the ethical consideration of that is now you can go, and in the US, sorry again, uh, you can get every single word that was uttered uh, by uh, the Supreme Court. You can text mine that, and you can use various kind of uh, um, uh, text mining tools, and, uh, and you can actually come up with rules that have not been determined by humans, but have been determined by machines. So this, this is an example of an ethical quandary that we're only just beginning to face. And so just thinking about that, okay, in one context, what does that have to do with biomedicine? I don't know, I can't make the connection right now, but at some, some point uh, I'll start thinking, oh yeah, that's what happened, I learned that from that, and now I can apply it to this. And I'm just making this up, but you get the idea. Okay, so Wikidata, see, I told you everything. <laughs> uh, I, I'm actually uh, totally enamored by what's happening, um, and I, it's just really fun to try and predict what is going to happen. But when I think about just this, the, these, these various, all this disparate data that's coming from so many different places, I just can't help believe that the, that the best answer is not with respect to at least the principles and how the Wikimedia Foundation operates and how Wikidata and Wikibase and Scolia and the tools that I see I'm mentioning all the words here uh, fit into this, um, that that is not going to become the major, a major, if not the major driver, a major driver of the future. It just seems to me that uh, you know, it's really important that we all get on board with that. And as a, res as a result of that, uh, as we build out the institute that I'm running, uh, and as it grows into something much bigger, uh, we have a Wikimedia in residence already. We will get more. We will, we will really adopt uh, Wikimedia principles in as much as we can in what we're doing and in any way we can. So uh, I thank you for all of you who are involved in that, and uh, I think it's really important to the future. So where do we go from here then? Uh, I think we follow the fourth paradigm. The data-driven economy writ large will drive more interest in structured data. So I think, and I just use that very broadly to bring in the context of the semantic web, at least the way I think about it. Uh, there's an opportunity to contribute, uh, but there's also an opportunity to gain from a broader spectrum of fair data of different types. And then I think, finally, uh, you need to be patient. Uh, the MMCF example, 20 years before that really became mainstream, um, I think those types of time frames are really shortened, but they're still not insignificant. And then I, I stole this uh, from a Metafax presentation, and really it just describes, uh, it's, it's hard to read, but uh, it's, again, it's in SlideShare, uh, both, both from Hush and Schmidt and from me now. Um, it's, uh, you know, you have this trigger of innovation, and then what follows is a peak of inflated expectations. That's then followed by a trough of disillusionment, followed by a slope of enlightenment and a plateau of productivity. So I think you have to figure out where you are on, those, on that curve, where you need to go uh, and get there. So I thank you very much for your attention. And I don't know if we have time for questions or anyone has a question, but hey, go for it. P push back. Thank you very much. I'll repeat it if you like. Okay. No, so we, you just mentioned that 90% of the time is spent on data preparation, right? And you hear this figure pretty much everywhere, right? Maybe by maybe. But the thing that I always don't understand is if this is true, when it comes to budget, right? The amount of 
Yeah, so the question, just very briefly, is you know, the budgets don't map to what it is you need to do with the data. All right? And so uh, that's, I couldn't agree with you more. Uh, I fought with that at the NIH. So just, again, not to be US-centric, but it's the only experience I have here, is that as the chief data officer, NIH is 27 institutes and centers. Right? So there's essentially 27 different silos. And I can tell you there's, there's a couple of issues. The first one is that each of the directors of those institutes doesn't understand diddly about data science. They may be, uh, or, or data per se, they may be, and undoubtedly are, fine and excellent scientists in the, in the fields that they work. But the data piece, they don't, unlike everyone in this room, they don't have data in their blood. So they basically have this notion that data doesn't actually cost anything. And why are we putting any money into this? You know, it, it's sort of, you know, I used to have this conversation all the time. So it's, it's really, uh, it's going to take time to get to the point of enlightenment. And I think the only way to do is to keep pushing on it. And I, you know, I think where it's coming from is a realization that, as I mentioned going along, that the private sector is really, when you start seeing huge, the NIH, for example, is a major funding agency, is very worried at the moment that they're behind in data science because they see the implications within the, the private sector where companies have spent a sign, the appropriate parts of their budget addressing these problems of data, whereas in the context of biomedicine, particularly as it relates to government funding worldwide, I'd say that has not happened. So all I could, I don't have a good answer, but I think that's the root cause. And I think it's really, I think over time it's going to take care of itself. But to accelerate that process, we have to be constantly reminding, and it's not just, it's actually within our own institutions. Because our institutions are just like those silos at NIH. You've got a whole series of schools, departments, totally siloed, don't actually see necessarily the, the value of shared data across the enterprise and what that can bring in terms of productivity and growth. And, but it's starting to happen and when they get that sense, a lot of institution, academic institutions have or are getting chief data officers and they're empowering them to change the situation. So I think the, the notion of the value of data is increasing but by talking about it we can actually accelerate it even further. Sorry that was a bit of a diatribe. So what you're really asking me is how do I help you get all of the NIH's data into Wikidata? Is that, or? I don't know if data parasites are bad. <laughs> I mean, I think that article just had a, a, a the, the, the data parasites article, it was in a New England Journal of Medicine, had an incredibly positive effect from, from the point of view of this audience. And I think there's a, there's a willingness to do that, but it sort of relates to this notion of education and cost. So I think getting you know, doing that, I think, I think there would be a lot of sympathy at this point to actually cr make more of that data available. And in fairness, NIH and have been, uh, as, a, as a funding agency, and this is true, of course, of other agencies in Europe as well, I think mainly of the Wellcome Trust, but have done a pretty good job at making their data available. And um, um, that comes from the research that they fund. Scientists uh, are, are not even available anymore. Uh, the data of, say, the first uh, first half of the last century. Yeah, well, I think that 
that's something that, again, I think there's interest in. I can just imagine what's going, you know, essentially the first thing would be, we don't do enough of this, and this is our own fault, is, you know, if I want data that goes, you know, back 50 years or more, the first question I'm going to get asked uh, from a bureaucrat is, how much is it going to cost and how much use is it going to have? And those are different, difficult questions, particularly the latter, are difficult questions to answer. But I think we need to have more sense, we need to project more sense of the value of data uh, to the community. I mentioned that in the context of raw data within structural biology. I'll just use that as an example. The problem there is, you know, some of that data is, is it's just been lost, it's irretrievable. On the other hand, a lot of it can be regenerated at higher quality than what, what it was generated originally and at a significantly lower cost. I think understanding those, that, that balance and those parameters and, uh, and, and actually coming up with a, a cost-benefit uh, analysis is what's needed to push this forward. Excellent. So, any further questions before we move on? Dean, do you have a question? All right. Very good. Okay. Well, uh, in that case, <laughs> we'd like to uh, Sorry. Uh, thank Professor um, Bourne again for his uh, excellent uh, keynote speech. Thank you. Thank you.